integrate yourself, everybody. I'm your host, Allison Palo, and you can find me at pureenergypdx.com. Today, we have a very special show. I have Christian Elliott on the show today. And he has been a coach since 2003. He's logged over 15,000 hours of one-on-one -on -one coaching. His quest to heal led him to personally use over three dozen different alternative modalities. He is an author, a speaker, and an educator. And uh, he's built one of the most holistic brick and mortar fitness and wellness businesses ever seen. His background and education are in, he's a certified personal trainer and life coach. He's certified, he's a certified nutrition coach. He holds a BS in communication from Calvin college. Uh, he's also uh, has a degree from Fuller theological seminary, and he is a full, he's been a full-time coach since 2003. Welcome to the show, Christian. I'm so excited that you're here and we're going to talk about some really great stuff today as it relates to health and so much more. Well, thank you very much for having me, Allison. It's, it's good to be here. You're so welcome. Um, yeah, so I just gave everybody uh, some of your background, but I'd love for you to share more about how you got into what you're doing now with health and fitness and, and share also what you're doing. Cause I think you're, you're doing a lot more than just training people um, now one-on-one, -on -one, right? There's, you're an author, you have, uh, you have been doing a lot of speaking lately. What is the kind of, let's start there. Let's just, I would love for you to share more about you and your journey, how you came to be doing what you're doing now. Okay, sure. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm somewhat of a unicorn in the, the health and wellness space. I've just followed my own interests over the years and they, they lead me in all sorts of different directions. So in about 2003, I just got married and um, my health wasn't great. And so I was kind of just started a quest to, to get ahead of that, to, to say, man, if I'm going to stay on this trajectory for the next 10, 20, 30 years, it's not going to go well. I want to have a good marriage and family life and be able to play with my kids. And so it, it really just started as a personal quest to get my health back or to get it to a, a place where I could be confident with it. And like a lot of people, that really opened my eyes to how much more I did not know about the realm of health. And so I you know, had the good fortune to find some doctors after bouncing around in the medical world, just outside of that way of thinking who taught me how to put my health back together. And so I, I really became insatiable with what else do I not know that has the potential to change my life in such a dramatic way. So that um, background led me to really study a lot of different areas of health, but you keep bumping into the business realm. Of like, why are there so many incentives that are backwards from what we want? And so um, it really became from a hobby to, People wanted to pay me for it. And so I, as I started piecing together a different way to talk about health, it's just kind of my nature is I like to understand root causes and what's driving different um, advice that we're getting. And when you look at the world of, of health and healthcare, and you understand that it's first a business and second, it's about the people. And so many doctors treat lab tests rather than people. And I just, as I started talking about it or explaining it in different ways, it, um, it led me to want to accumulate certification so I could talk with some sort of piece of paper that I could hang on the wall that people would never ask to see. And that, that accumulation of, of different certifications, if we all just led me to say, you know, why don't we try to put something together? My wife and I originally conceived of having a retreat center to kind of extract people from society and heal them and then send them back and it's like, good luck, hope it sticks. And we realized that our life didn't change that way. So why are we trying to change other people that way? So we got jobs at big corporate gym and, and started working in the fitness nutrition realm and then um, had an opportunity to open our own little humble four, or sorry, 400 square foot space and did well there. So we expanded it and kept growing. And so we were brick and mortar for about nine years, uh, just growing to collect as many holistic disciplines as we could, the ones that we had tried or that we knew would be effective. And originally we had the mindset of, okay, if we just get good enough at the tactics of health, if we just can get enough of the right practitioners and we can figure out who to, which person should work on this person first, we get their diet cleaned up, we get them on a good exercise routine and help them de-stress with these different modalities we had. And what I realized eventually, it, it took me longer than I'd like to admit, but what occurred to me is if, unless I address the whole person here, um, 
our success rates aren't really that much better than everyone else. So what would it take then to create a breakthrough that sticks, like a transformation story where they can mark an inflection point of I met Christian or his wife or came to their business and I was never the same. That's the experience we wanted to create. And so we started um, realizing we need to address the whole human. Like, unless we're doing that, we're yeah. probably not going to um, be as effective as we think we could be. So if my, I have a you know, communications background, I have a, a master's of divinity degree. So I kind of bring different hats to yeah. knowing what's, what's really driving a human. And then by layering those together, um, and zooming out and really realizing, okay, there's something timeless we can definitely sink our teeth into with human physiology. That's not going to change. That's set. But human nature is also timeless. It doesn't change. We, all the you know history repeats itself, right? Well, it's because humans are predictable. And yeah. when we recognize that human nature is fixed, and then we can understand this person has a life and they have a history and they have a story that is relevant. They have aspirations or they have baggage. And you can actually kind of look at them from that level you can almost approach it with project management lenses and say, well, what would it take for this person, whether you need to be tender or crack the whip or unearth why they're, what's the story they've lived by for so long that has kept them right. stuck. You start yeah. to, like, to your, to the wonderful name of your podcast, you start to integrate the whole person into a strategy. And we found that's just become our love. So in 2017, we um, we had to close down the business we were in. So we had that, a pivot clean slate moment to say, wait a minute, what, yeah. what work do we want to be doing? And we kind of clarified what I just told you. That's, that's what we want to do. So we've been virtual doing this ever since, um, you know, taking your lumps, just learning to, to cut your teeth in the virtual world is definitely a learning curve, Absolutely. But, um, somehow survived that. And then, um, <laughs> have been able to just find a way. So I, I spend a lot of time with clients and blogging and, um, coming on podcasts like this and, helping where I can. So we've got, we've got another project we're working on for this year, but I can tell you more about that if you want. So yeah, yeah, definitely. I really, I, I resonate with that because <clears throat> yeah, I was doing more in-person coaching until, uh, you know, the pandemic hit. And then I had to really learn the skill set of helping people online. And it's a whole, whole different world, yes. just a whole different skill set as it relates to training someone. And it's really, taking a step back in some respects and, um, you know, uh, working on different things than you would like when you, when you're in person. And, and it's been really great. I've enjoyed it. Although I do like the person to person connection and seeing people, you know, one-on-one -on -one that way as well. Um, there's also a benefit to <clears throat> seeing people virtually too, because then you can work on, uh, the so-called smaller things or things that we really don't get to work in, on in the gym. Um, and some of the, even the spiritual and mindful aspects of their journey too, which I really, really enjoyed. And um, because, you know, sometimes in the gym, it's not always the right atmosphere to talk about spirituality or mindfulness when we're like, when someone's just wanting to you know, go get a good workout in or something. So I found that I was having, you know, that was like a desire for me to help people that way, but it was a little challenging being in that atmosphere. So bringing it online actually did help me um, hone into that a little bit more and figure out how I wanted to help people that way, mm -hmm. rather than just um, little bits and pieces here and there, you know? Yeah, yeah. for sure. No, it's, it's, it's a different animal to think like what would it take to have a virtual coach who can look at my life because obviously I'm not I can't touch your cue your body in a particular right. way it's like no you should feel it here or you like do it as I do it so there are limitations to it but there's also upside because what I found or at least what I I was just told this to my wife today I said I really love what I do I get to very quickly go to the heart of the matter and not talk about fluffy things and what that guy over there across the gym is doing or what's on the tv or what yeah. who's you know what the weather is we go straight to what's going to move the needle today? Where, where do you feel stuck? And that is because my interests are so varied and I've studied broadly, I can go to so many different places with people and it, it does lend to um, the kind of people who are actually ready to face themselves have become our clientele. It's, it's people in the business wisdom is right. Always niche down and find a really small specific problem. And I've, despite that I've, I've been able to niche up to to as we as i like to say like i love that I, our mindset is is really that is our niche like the people who are ready for change ready to face themselves 
ready to turn the mirror back around and say, oh, where have I been the problem? And maybe I should face this procrastination issue I have. Maybe I should actually look at why I keep getting stuck in this pattern and what are the triggers and why, why does my um, mom wound? Why does my, the bully from school or, or why does, why do I get so triggered when my kids do this or when my boss does that? And um, to be able to say, what life do you really want? What's yes. the golden ticket at the end of all of this hard work? Is it going to be worth it? Why is it? Well, I was just doing this this morning with someone like, help me understand the life you want. Because unless I can address that, we're probably just going to layer another willpower exercise over your schedule, <laughs> which is not going to be much fun. So why don't we actually figure out where we're going to go? Why don't we slow down so we can speed up? And so far, so good. It seems to be a, um, an effective way to go. And it sure is fun for me to be doing this work. Yeah, I feel like that willpower pushing through is a little bit of the old way of doing things. And I'm discovering that people are really open now, much more open than they used to be to um, exploring themselves. And it could be the virtual aspect of it. Like you're saying it, I never thought about it like that. Um, but it does make sense because there's no distractions. It's just you and that person. And it is a great opportunity to be able to focus on really what is holding them back, what's keeping them stuck. And then they can own their own experience of it instead of you telling them, Hey, this is the experience you, you know, you could have, you should have or whatever. But, you know, as we all, as coaches, we want our clients to have great experiences, but until they really own it and take responsibility for their own journey, um, there's really not much else we can do. You know, we're, we're the guides. So that's, um, that's so important. And I, I love what you put up here about, um, we were, uh, about things that you want to discuss about, um, and, and I heard you talk about this in, a, in another podcast, the, um, the, uh, higher side chats podcast about, uh, you know, helping people with obstacles to, uh, really start, you know, uh, creating that sustainable change uh, and helping them stick with uh, a practice, which is really the biggest challenge I feel as a trainer and a coach is <clears throat> getting people to really begin to enjoy their own practice, their own ownership. And, and I, in the beginning, when I first started all of this, I kind of felt like it was, I was, um, I was the motivator and it was like, you know, and it's to some extent we can be that and inspire people, but at the same time, you want them to, you want them to discover something that works for them based on their values. Right. And mm -hmm. so helping them discover what they value mm -hmm. so that, because it's going to be different than what I value. And, and, you know, that's for them to, to find out. And so when you start to bring that it to light, the, those values that you have, then you, then all of the other work and the stories that you've had, can actually uh, dissipate to some extent because then you're able to get clear on why you're there and your purpose and what you really want, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, well, when you're you're talking about um, trying to find what it is that's going to motivate a person, you're right. You you can't motivate anyone. That they, they're either motivated or they're not. But what we can do is offer them stories. We can offer them perspective that brings hope alive. We can offer them a window into what life could look like. And we can shepherd them along with questions that say, well, what if that was possible? Or what would have to be true for you to believe that? What would have to be true for your life to look like that? And somehow in the willingness to ask and to answer those questions, and not everyone is willing to sit with those because it can be hard to be quiet and actually let your heart go, can I say something? Because I would really like, and often we, we go quiet to ask the question and the, the picture of what we could want. It's, it's very fascinating to me how few people can answer that question of, well, what do you want life to look like? We can get generalities and we think if I get my weight down or if I make this much money or if like, then life will be amazing. And usually those are the side effects of what you're actually seeking. And then there's, there's deeper drivers of um, romance and significance and dignity and fairness and justice and you know uh, so many different things that make us all human we want to master things we want to have a sense of autonomy but we also want to have a sense of contribution and if if those are unmet we will irrationally seek to meet them in all sorts of different ways 
And so a lot of what I do is just, I end up helping people discover what their drivers are. And yeah. often it's through mirroring the opposite. Do you feel unseen? Do you feel unlovable? Do you feel insignificant? Do you feel like you don't have what it takes? And in just rambling off with, you know, I just don't ramble. I, I come up with like a, a rough guess based on doing this for a while. Is it, does it feel like this? Right. And their ability to mirror back to me and say, if I, I'll throw three or four of them. That, like, it's not that, it's not that. It's like, oh, that's, and then you, you, you unearth the story that right. is the, the challenge that if they stopped believing that, or if they saw a possibility where they didn't see it before, it's like they can finally take a deep breath. Like the clouds just parted and wait a minute, my life could change. And so hope has now inserted itself. And then you, then to your point, we have the, the consistency factor becomes a very important piece of the puzzle. And then it's this relentless detective work for what are the things that want to just rob you of, of progress that would, easily come in and interrupt you and how the heck do we outthink them before they show up so that it doesn't keep happening so a simple example is you know if you have young kids like i do they can trigger you they're, they're really good at pushing your buttons sometimes. they just want to get under <laughs> like they're not they're being kids they, they're operating with the maturity level that they have and there's some ways we would want them to be more virtuous that they're just not ready for it yet right so they come in and they, they want to push your buttons and so to be able to take a moment and and where you're amygdala fires and you're ready to just bite their head off and send them to the corner and you're really like whatever things we say that as right. parents we kind of forehead smack like i probably shouldn't have said that <laughs> if you can pause the moment when you start to feel that emotion come up and like oh hang on the me is feeling frustrated the me feels irritated the me feels angry the me feels what or if you it's almost like it sounds funny to say the me but it's the third person okay there's some other thing going on inside me and i want to seek to understand it it's just the simple act right. of pausing it. I had a client tell me this week, she didn't even have the answer for what emotion she had. She just knew if I pause the moment, that emotion slowly dissipated, it diffused. And I was able to not I think it was kick my kid out of the car, like just to be able to go, oh, hang on, here comes that emotion again. This is not, this doesn't mean I'm a bad mom. I don't care about my kids. I'm incapable. I'm defective or whatever the negative story she was used to telling herself. And when she simply paused the moment and said, I can choose differently. I don't have to get irritated right now. And she chose differently. And those moments of flexing the muscle of introspection or of self-awareness to say, wait, I'm not, I'm not at the whims of this emotional roller coaster. I can actually decide if I want to ride it or not. And that it opens up an ability at, internally to go, well, shoot, if I did that, maybe I can get to bed on time. Maybe I can get to the gym. Maybe I can cook my dinner more often than I'm used to. And you just, we, to, to feel like you're making progress, you need a lot of little wins strung together, but it takes a level of emotional maturity to say, I signed up for struggle. Like there's, there's no path I can give anyone where there's, this is all sunshine and rainbows and this is going to be hard, right? Whichever right. path we pick in life, if we're going to struggle and strive to get better at anything, it's going to be hard, no matter which one you pick. Yeah. <sighs> I signed up for that. <laughs> Fabulous. Like now I can at least get on with it because I'm expecting it to have challenges to it. And I'm not blindsided or irritated that it did. So now that I know I get to choose my suffering, how do I be a more centered, rational, non-anxious presence wherever I go? And that, that perspective often is what we need when some of the clients you're talking about, we're like, oh, how do I help with this motivation puzzle? And how do I help? Because if there's no motivation, there's no consistency, right? Yeah. So if we can open their awareness to other ways of being or other possibilities, other stories that are not too dissimilar from them. It, it offers them the potential for um, a flourishing life they didn't think was possible or that they might have thought was, but they had no clue how to get there. Absolutely. So. Yeah. That's, I love that. I love that so much. Yeah. That's um, it, it's, it is, it's opening them up to possibilities that they didn't even consider because they are stuck in this, in their story and thinking that's how, like, that's the only thing they know to do, mm -hmm. but there are choices. And until there, that is um, until you create the space to become aware of that, that's, that's going on. And, and again, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to probably say something every once in a while that you're not, that you're going to maybe have some regrets about, you know, but give yourself some uh, compassion and, uh, you know, have grace with it. That's the thing that I, that I've been also talking about is, you know, we don't, we, we rarely 
allow ourselves to make mistakes gracefully, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that's another important thing is like, especially when you're learning something for the first time, for some reason people, and I've had many people come to me like, why can't, why aren't, why aren't I doing this? Like perfectly. You've only been doing it for a month. Like it's, it's, right. it takes time. You know how, how much athletes work on these kinds of things. I mean, it's, it's like, it is, you're taking one step at a time, you know, you're learning a, a certain aspect of it, stepping back and then learning a different aspect as you come back, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it kind of flows, it ebbs and flows. It's not linear. Right. So right. it is, it is one of those things to teach people how, how the process actually works and to not beat themselves too much up about it as well because, uh, you know, change is a process and, and like getting clear, like we talked about in the very beginning and what you really want and what you, you know, also, mm -hmm. like you said, connecting to those deeper desires, you know, cause like, you know, it may not be the weight loss. It may not be the money. That's like you said, a side effect. It's really the deeper desire. If that is not addressed, then the, the changes will probably be pretty temporary. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it, it's important to remember on any change journey that the sooner this clicks, the faster the whole journey goes. Like mistakes are just baked into the process. Yeah. Having you're going to burn a dinner, you're going to make something your kids like, I don't like that. I'm not going to eat it or whatever the, the obstacle is where it's just it doesn't you're, you're disappointed and your time horizon that you thought it was going to happen is is not actual reality. And to be able to say, huh, OK, it's not going the way I want. So what would have to change? There's, there's, there's a, a hidden principle in that simple, huh, it's, it's to be able to, like I said earlier, pause a moment, but to, instead of just pausing and then going right back to being frustrated is to say, what does it take to be fascinated by what's going on rather than frustrated by it? Yeah. And if you can flip a curiosity switch to say, wait, hang on, what, what's triggering me? And we can remove this unicorn idea that you're going to be perfect from the equation because that's an illusion. It's almost the enemy of progress because <laughs> we hold up this impossible standard, especially for ladies. Oh my gosh, they have to have it all, can do all the things and have babies, can still be sexy, can still cook dinner on time and have my hair and nails <laughs> done. And all of the weighty pressures that feel like constantly you try to tell you you're not good enough. And to be able to remove the expectation of perfection and say, what are the essentials here? And to say, why am I so triggered? What in the world? And, and to just be how fascinating that I'm thinking this or feeling that, or that, wow, I didn't realize it. There was a lot of internal work to do before my body was actually going to start the cleanup process or the weight loss process. And the body wants to heal sometimes before it's interested in weight loss. It wants to do that you know, we'll get to that later. But for now, right. I'm, going, I'm solving this hormonal problem you have. And eventually we'll get to that. And to be able to be okay with it, to have patience for the process and to just say, am I, am I focused on the things that inevitably are going to be good for me? If the answer for that is yes, okay, great. Let's keep doing that. Autopilot that thing. And then let's figure out what's to optimize next. It goes a long way to this process of climbing and then eventually coming to the limits of what those new measures are. And then you plateau and then you, you okay, with that knowledge, let me climb again. What most people do is they climb and they, get, they plateau and like, oh, it's not working anymore. I was supposed to lose a pound a week, crap. And then they, they get frustrated. So they just slide right back down the same mountain and they just keep repeating the loop over and over. Right. And sometimes it just, it, it really takes a different approach and we don't see it modeled much in society. That's part of what it's I like about true. the work I do. It's just, yeah. who, who's, who's stepping back and looking at the person as a whole unit rather than this it, we, it, whether it's medical or alternative, we're almost still guilty of like find symptom, treat symptom, whether it's yeah. supplement or drug, or whether it's a corrective exercise or a rehabilitative thing from a physical trainer it's, or physical yeah. therapist. So it is almost all physical, really, even at, in the alternative realm. That's true. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's so much, the physical is so dependent on the energetic, you know, mm -hmm. they work together. That's yeah. why it's important to be aware of how the, how they interplay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're electrical beings first and chemical second. And our whole model is built on chemical. Even, even the supplement realm is like chemical. We don't give a, a, a place for the fact that our energy management or the electrical fields we surround ourselves by or the people we surround ourselves by have a fantastic influence, positive or negative, in our lives. And 
to be able to, we've, you know, you've also like, there's the vibe somebody gives off or you feel this different energy when you walk in a room. Well, that's a real thing. Like that's part of who are you surrounding yourselves with you? Cause you become an average of who you hang out with. So if we are selective about the environments we put ourselves in, we protect our mind share so that it's not diluted with garbage or it's, you know, you're pouring Coke into something that just should be water. Let's just stick with water. Like that, that protect thinking of your mind that way and what you're, you allow to come into your consciousness, who you allow to come in, what books you um, read or what news sources you follow. So much of our ability to stay above that frenetic energy just comes from protecting the inputs, recognizing our limits and being able to say, okay, how am I gonna make the most of this day? And try to live to your point in a more integrated way. Yeah, and I, as you were speaking, I, I it came to mind that, probably one of the biggest health uh, issues that has cropped up in the past couple of years is media, you know, Mm -hmm. like news, people watching news, I feel like are the most stressed out, anxiety ridden Mm -hmm. people that that I've noticed, you know, and it's really interesting to, because I've just been, you know, recommending people stop watching the news because- (laughs) It's- yeah, it's a catch-22 because people, they, <laughs> they have this, I want to feel informed. Right. But the, what, what many people are unaware of, not everyone, and even if you are aware of it, it doesn't mean you're above it. So right. what many people are not aware of is how media is intentionally trying to agitate you. Its job yeah. to keep you engaged is to make you feel like you're missing out on something or there's yes. a demon behind every bush and there's going to be fear that you need to be aware of. And so on the 10 o'clock news tonight, there's a murder in town, whatever. It's just, it's just a, if you haven't seen the movie, The Social Dilemma, yes, to I've see how it. highly sophisticated they are at keeping your attention and keeping you in fear and pulling you back into the matrix. And so it, my point is, if, even if you know that's what they're doing, you're still not above the influence of it. So sometimes there has to be better gatekeepers. Like, what are my new sources? What are my principles, my boundaries? That Because we, especially in the COVID era, way too much coming at us that doesn't make any sense. And we yes. need to stay ahead of it and at least be aware. Um, but how do we find sources of information that give us hope, that give us direction, that give us clarity, that will tell us if this guy is falling because they can talk to us like adults and tell us this is going to get ugly and right. we need to be prepared for something. But they don't do it with a fear-mongering um, marketing agenda. They just, they, to, to find, it's the reason politicians that, that don't get elected if they tell you the truth because all they want to have, everything's going to be great. We're going to print more money. We can promise you everything, all those bridges you want done and the hospitals you want built and every wish is your is our command. And people vote for that. They don't vote for, okay, here's the deal. This is going to get ugly and we better um, make some hard choices and we're going to have to live with less and we're going to have to rally and we're going to have to come together. Like that's just, it's divided. It's dividing race. It's dividing vaccinated and unvaccinated. It's just constantly trying to pull us apart because they want our attention and where eyes go, money flows. So if we don't give them our eyes, I don't know if you saw the news today, today, Mark Zuckerberg's net worth went down by 29 billion. Because wow, I didn't a see million that. people got off Facebook last month. <laughs> they're, they're losing market share because people are finally getting fed up. Like, if, here's the deal. If Facebook goes away if we all leave. The only way that's they true. make money is if we scroll. Because yeah. when we scroll, they deliver ads. And that's the revenue. So if you don't scroll, Facebook makes no money off of you. What a thought. So anyway, they, they, they're masterful at trying to capture your mind share. And if we just start breaking up with them, plugging into real community again, we have so much opportunity that the earth's abundance is barely, if we probably hit 1% of what this earth is capable of, if we just you're right. stop oppressing it. Yeah, <laughs> so. absolutely. Yeah. We, there's so much potential there that mm-hmm. we're not even aware of um, because we're distracted, you know, by all this stuff. And, and that's another health tip is, you know, stop you, do, If you're going to use social media, use some discernment around it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that's if you start really feeling your heart rate go up and you're feeling agitated, turn it off. Like it, mm-hmm. that's, yeah. that's pulling you into a negative space. And for, you know, there's no one, like if everybody followed this rule, we would defend fear from social media. There's not a rule like that, no. <laughs> but there is a, a core guiding principle of like, this is, I'm feeling anxious. I feel irritable. I'm short with my kids. I mm-hmm. I'm jaded when I look at the world, 
or I can't sleep well, or my heart rates, if those things are happening, you're over consuming. It is yeah. turn yeah. it off. And it may be you turn it off for an hour. You maybe turn it off for a month and you don't go back to it. And in reality, if something important happens, you will find out about it. I you know. Find out right? about it first. I always find it. Who cares? Like <laughs> the, you don't need, there's, there's no, and you're not just like, okay, finally I finished the internet. It won't happen. You're, you're not going to get through it all. So what do you actually need to know? What things are worth staying on top of? Find those few things and check out of the rest because it's just trying, you cannot fight every battle that is worthy of another warrior. It's impossible. Right. So, so pick one, yeah. maybe two. Fight that for me and protect my kids. I'm going to try to pull as many people out of the matrix as I can this year and build hey. communities as ferociously as I possibly can. Because if, if I check out and my wife, family and I are like, great, we've got plenty of food and um, we, we don't have that tracking app on our phone, but I have no friends <laughs> that have done that. I'm like, I'm not any better off. So like, right, we've got right. to be not just playing defense, <laughs> but also playing offense to go make these changes happen. Yeah. Making connections, building community um, mm -hmm. in a different way than, you know, what we've been doing in the past, I think mm -hmm. is really important. And I've also been meeting a lot of people here, um, a lot of different groups that are really on the same page. And it's great to connect with people who, um, you know, not completely on the same page with everything in life, but, but there is like a, you know, a common value there that we all share. And um, it's really, it's really important, I think, for people to be able to do that, especially after the past two and a half years or so that we've had this isolation period. And, and I believe that that has also led to a lot of the health issues that we're, we're also seeing right now too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I wanted to also talk about, uh, I know that you had, I, I don't remember specifically, but I remember hearing you talk about um, the VAX and uh, you had some kind of, uh, you had done some research yourself on on, on the uh, that. And I don't know if you want to get into that, but what, where are you at with all of that right now? And what are you seeing that's, that's happening with that? Oh boy. Um, it's a big we, subject. We may need a longer but... <laughs> podcast. But no, well, there's, um, <laughs> what do you yes, want to I, touch yeah, upon with that? I, I guess I, I, you could say I've been doing my homework on on COVID and um, doing. Well, my I'll just best say, like, I really there. resonated when I heard you talk about that because I do the same thing. So we're mm -hmm. on the same page there because I've been really curious about this for ever since it came out. Mm -hmm. um, the whole thing started because it just seemed fishy to me. I was like, I know how the immune system works. I know how the mm -hmm. body works. This does not, this does not mesh. This doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense, but I, no, I want to just say that real quick before you get started. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I guess by, uh, I'll give you, I guess the quick version of my experience living through COVID. So uh, to back up before that, so 2003, is, I, like I mentioned, trying to get my health back is when my eyes started being open to the big business that is the pharmaceutical industry and the agricultural business. And to recognize that so much of what our governments tell us is just flat out wrong, or that the regulatory agencies are have more or less, even back then, were more basically just marketing arms of the industries they were supposed to regulate. And so in my study, I, I knew those well enough to say, FDA, CDC, those, those institutions are corrupt, and they are actually not looking out for the people. What I did not understand was that all of the regulatory agencies have been captured and that there is a much bigger puzzle of what's going on with the, the banking systems around the world and m corporate consolidations and hedge funds and all of the puppeteering that has been in place for decades. It's really what, what my perspective is we are living through the latest iteration of the timeless battle between good and evil. There are some yes. very sinister, dark, sickening, I would call them evil slash satanic forces behind what we're living through. And you know, I can back that up with patents like Lucifer Ace and 666 weird, World Order. Like, you yeah. really, is that just a randomly assigned patent I number? Know, right? Why would isn't someone that... patent Lucifer Ace as a as the enzyme you want in your vaccine? Anyway, so my, my point is there's- <laughs> it's kind there's, of obvious to me. <laughs> right, somebody has an agenda here. And what I, what I didn't know as, as I studied COVID, that some of the things that started waking me up were I, at the whole, in, until- really before the the vaccine came out the whole time I was thinking this is just pharma flexing their muscle mm -hmm. showing us that they own the media they 70 percent of the advertising 
50 to 70, somewhere in there, is how much funding the media companies get from pharma. So of course they get to control the narrative. What I didn't know and what started to put cracks in my perspective is like, wait a minute, how in the world did pharma get all the world leaders to use the slogan build back better? Like that's not a pharma move. Like that whole great reset my, and looking at the admittedly breathtaking jaw dropping detailed plans they have come up to enslave the whole world. It is unimaginably complicated. Like it mind boggling how much work they've put into it. That didn't start with a, a bat and a penguin getting it on somewhere in China and the rest <laughs> of it. Like, they've been doing that for a long time. They've been planning this yeah. and realizing the breadth of the planning that had to be bigger than just pharma doing it. And which is, I guess, uh, so, I don't know where I read it, but the, the point of, of awakening as liberation is like freedom. I understand what's happening. And it's also the flip side of that same coin is it's terrifying. Like, holy cow, like pretty much all the government is out to get us. And there's this yeah. global plot to take over and enslave the human race. And it, it takes a while of catching your breath when that starts to become, oh man, I can't deny that. And then you look at the volume of tools they have developed and we are We've just begun year three of the 10 year plan that is the Great Reset. So, welcome to year three, everyone. Uh, they just had the kickoff party. It wasn't that fun. And now, what do they have next in store for us? So, in short version, I think they're going to jack with our food system and they are taking over the banking system and they're doing it intentionally because the system they have set up is coming to the end of its life cycle and is going to implode. <laughs> so, I that's the short version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it is as we're as sure of that as we are the sun's going to come up tomorrow that yeah. this system is run out of money it is going to end and the people it can't are trying be, to do, it can't be sustained it's no. just not going to be able to exist as long as also people are starting to wake up and realize their own potential mm -hmm. you know and saying no to things uh, i'm already seeing too and so that gives me hope that you know uh but there will be also i think people who were like you said uh like it occurred to me years ago when I was learning about all this stuff that mm -hmm. the fear comes in like, oh my God, you know, what can you possibly do about this? This seems bigger than anything. But what we don't realize is that um, everybody as an individual does have a lot of power. Um, if you start to transform yourself from the inside, that actually um, creates a lot of change in the world and in all the people that you connect with as well. So I think there is some hope. I think they're energetically, things are going to shift into mm -hmm. a, a much better, but it will be a little rocky probably as people start to learn about what has been happening, because I'm always surprised um, by people not understanding the role that all this is, you know, the pharmaceuticals are playing and uh, you know, all the other um uh, people in, in, you know, with the financial industry and all that too. And, you know, so it, 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 if you have not been learning about all this stuff and, you know, not from a fear perspective, perspective, but just from information and then integrating it slowly, mm -hmm. when you hear all this, it might be a little shocking for, for people, I think, you know? Oh yeah. If, if what yeah. I, if you had somebody that didn't know half of what I just said, I just blew their mind probably. And they're like, you can feel an anxiety come up in your belly of like, oh man, what if he's right? <laughs> or this guy's crazy, let's turn it off. But the point being, I, well, I'm not going to leave you in that headspace because <laughs> we are, yes, if we don't understand what we're up against, we're powerless to fight it. If we don't know what's coming, how do we pivot and get right. away from it? So it's like naivety, yeah, you know? Yeah, just, we have, yeah, we have to know what, somebody has to give it to us straight. Like yeah. we're dealing with evil. Okay, got it. I still think we're on the winning team. We can I don't handle think, it. Yes, it's going to be a bumpy <laughs> ride the next yeah. few years. Okay, so that's going to happen. So there's, in my mind, there's two big strategies we can deploy. One is proactively fighting the machine. We can protest and we can do signatures on petitions and we can do lawsuits and we can write our congressman or run for office. We can, we can go out and we can try to um, make a difference and push back against this evil. The other side of that is that we can just opt out of everything they want us to do. If they don't want us to gather, we gather. If they don't want us to use this kind of education, we use that education. If they don't want us using a phone outside their tech grid, we find a phone. If they want us ordering everything from Amazon and Walmart, we take the inconvenient step and we find something somewhere else. Like, so essentially we, we, we reclaim our sovereignty over the areas of life they are trying to entangle us in. And unless we do that, to put all of our chips on the table and say, all we got to do is just fight the machine and 
wait for that lawsuit and Fauci's finally going to go to jail. How long we've we been waiting for that? Way yeah, too long. Right. If, if that's our, our golden ticket out of this, we've missed the opportunity to go to a, a better place. I don't want to go back to normal because normal got us in this mess. Yeah. So why don't we go to something better? And the only way we do that is local communities, like the, our conversation earlier, right? The internet and virtual is amazing because it gives us so many more minds that can connect from so many places and share resources and ideas. But where this, where we win this is local and we have got to get back to local community to, to the type of life we never knew we always wanted of, yeah, oh, right. this is what it feels like to have friends. This is what it feels like to do life together. And maybe we swim in a lake because they keep us out of the pools that are depending on which state you live in, right? Well, that's but, what happened well, the past couple right. of summers here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. We just find yeah. a different way to do life. We dissolve the tyrannical control grid into irrelevance Mm -hmm. by just creating better options where we don't need them anymore. And yeah. we have to do that locally. There's no, there's no one national formula we can apply because every state and every community has a little bit different needs, but we can know that this business is hurting. Why don't we all get together and go support it and, and become patrons of that business? Why don't we all right. um, meet together and figure out who's going to go talk to the attorney general? Who, why don't we find out who in this family can grow food? Who in this, in this community um, knows an electrician? And we, we start networking and, and just finding where we can get our food and, and figuring out how do we get a different IP address? Like whatever the things are that we need to do to say, nope, I'm out. And they can rattle their sabers and tell us we have to do these things. And they just, they just sound silly because none of those are influencing my life anyway. Right. To me, those are the two strategies, proactively going after and attacking it. But if, if that's not also partnered with building community locally, to me, there's a both and, and I can't tell you if it's 60, 40 or 50, 50 or, but I know we don't win it if we don't build local communities, because otherwise we will continue to live in fear and be at the mercy of whatever supply yeah. chain disruptions are going on and so on. Um, so I totally think we win this, but if we're not braced for the fight, if we don't know that the famine is coming, it's going to be really hard to be prepared for it. If we just think that things are going to stay as they have been for so long. Nope, they're not. So Right. Anyway. Yeah. So get to know the people in your community, what skill sets they have. We've yes. already been doing that here and, um, you know, have them, you know, have a way to get contact them. If there's ever an emergency, you know, have, have a way to get in touch with your people. Yep. Um, you know, cause uh, who knows? I mean, I don't want to, I, I don't want to spread fear, more fear than has already been spread, mm -hmm. you know, cause I don't really think that, I think we're all going to be fine. I actually think we're going to be heading into a very uh, beautiful space. I think uh, as this is really uh, trans, it's a very transformative time for people mm -hmm. and we're never going to be the same that we were, but that's actually a good thing because we're evolving into something different. That's much more self-realized and has higher potential. And of course, there's going to be people that stay in fear and want to be in that dimension of reality. And that's okay. You know, it's, um, I'm not here to drag anybody away from what they want to be doing. Right. Mm -hmm. But what I want to do is create what I, I want to be living in, you know, and so that's what I'm moving toward and, mm -hmm. and, and going about it that way and focusing what I, what I want to create instead of what I don't want. And of course, like you said, there has to be also some discernment around what you're dealing with, what you're up against. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the same time, a, a surrendering to, okay, I can't change some of those things, but what mm -hmm. I can change, or like you mentioned, the things in my life that I can proactively do, Mm -hmm. that will change my life, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, there's the project that we are undertaking this year, we're calling it the Sovereignty Project. And it's really just what, what my wife and I realized is as we started to understand the gravity or the breadth of the plans of how they're attempting to enslave us, we said, okay, well, we can, like I was, I already opted out of the employment system. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, right? I, we don't have our kids in the public school system, so we're outside the education system, but there's other ones I'm not. So what, what, what do we need to be able to, opt out of. And we stepped back and said, okay, here's, and we ended up with six different areas where we think these are the things we are going to have to opt out of if we're going to um, not be able to be put under their thumb and, and oppressed. And we realized we have to take people with us. Otherwise this doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> we have to, we have to have community to do this. And so. Um, oh, absolutely. We need each then, other. Yeah. No, totally but we do. also realized the best way to learn something is to teach it. And 
part of oh, yeah. our my my I guess wiring is I'm I'm pretty good at finding complicated and digesting it and distilling it down to action steps and then mapping it out and saying how are we going to approach uh, this process of helping people change in a in a methodical way that is not overwhelming that takes over and says I hear you but I'm going to win this there's a path through this and it just because to your point, if, if we live in the headspace of fear, we're losing. And there's a, there's a scripture that says we have not been given a spirit of fear. Mm-hmm. Um, and what replaces that is a spirit of power and a spirit of love. And of, there's different translations for the third one, but a sound mind or self-discipline. Mm-hmm. Um, so what would it look like to operate in a spirit of power or in a spirit of yeah. self-control or a spirit of love? And if we operate from that space, if we have a methodical plan that we are following and we can say, I'm not there yet, there's a lot more I can change, but I know the game. I know what steps I can take. To your point, it just it just diffuses fear, it just drives it out. Yeah. And you have confidence and a quiet sense of like, you're not bothered with the distractions of what's going on. You're like, yep, I knew that's coming. Anyway, I'm marching forward because I'm doing the things that I know um, are part of building a life-giving, flourishing human society. And we all have the potential to do that, um, come what may. And look at what's going on in Canada, the truckers. It's, it's oh my a, gosh, that, yeah, that, that was incredible. Human, I, get, I get choked up almost every time I see it because it's to me, it's just a testament of the human spirit of how much we want freedom. That laughable, offensive, you will own nothing and you'll be happy promo video that the uh, World Economic yeah. Forum. It's like, it's, it's why sick. do you not, you don't understand human nature, do you? Because <laughs> we're, no class, we don't like that actually. But uh, Canada is a perfect example right now of like, no, we, we actually like freedom and we come together. And to your point earlier, there are so many things that unite us, that make us um, the same, that, and we're intentionally, they try to wedge things into our they so consciousness do. Trying to, separate to, people. to keep us divided. But we have so much in common and we all yeah. want to eat. We all want to be respected. We all want to be uh, to have fairness. And, and you go down this list of like, well, yeah, we all want all of those things. Well, yeah, you're you're not so bad. Like, yeah, I kind of like you. Like, you're my like. It, we just build right. so many bridges rather than walls by recognizing our shared humanity. That all of this gets so much easier when we turn off the negative inputs, stay informed, have a methodical plan, and then just go about this. The community building can be a hot mess if you're in it for yourself. But if you yeah. step back and say, I'm going to do this humbly, I'm not going, it, it, there's certain parameters you want to put in place to go all in and investing in community and not have it just become, you know, infighting. So there's ways to do it well. Yeah. Um, and it, But to your point, it's going to stretch us to have those skills to build the community we actually want. So yeah, it's here's a our opportunity process. right in front of us. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it, it, there's a lot of different communities that are, uh, are popping up that people are planning and stuff. And people are talking about these things all over the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of options, you know, you don't have to like be in some kind of, uh, you know, it, it, what we used to think of those kinds of communities, I guess, like a hip hip, nothing against hippies, but you know, not everybody wants to do that. You know, right. some people just want to have like a regular, you know, uh, community where they can have, uh, you know, be a sovereign human being, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. and that's, I think the point we're at, it's, it's becoming, uh, we're having to set our boundaries around that. And that to me is an act of love is setting your boundaries and then unconditional love takes it a step further and you're seeing yourself and other people, right. It's, Mm -hmm. it's like their reflection of you. And so we're all connected that way. And so if we can start moving more towards, really appreciating each other for, for wherever they're at. Um, even appreciating the bad guys, you know, like they're, they have a part to play too. You know, they're all, everybody is from source to some extent. We're all, you know, a part of it, a part of that, this, uh, whole big, you know, play. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you can begin to step out of that a bit and take some time, I mean, it's taken me years to kind of get to this point, but, you know, start to appreciate, all everything and the beauty of life and everything that people bring to the table it's really interesting you know Mm -hmm. yeah well there's there's beauty in our diversity the idea that the way the world's going to survive is if there's less of us and we 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 fight these battles that they tell us to fight they're they're there's just people that have control that want more of it and when we recognize to your point our shared humanity and we can focus on that and then the questions that are relevant to our local communities that's where 
it, community starts to feel like something special. And if you have visions of hippy dippy, like, and especially if you're an introvert like me, like, oh, I can only handle so much community, man. Like, really? Right. Glad. I'm going to, I'm probably you want your personal some, space. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm probably going to have some, like, okay, this is how, like, I want to eat. I want to have things for my kids to do. Like, there's, there's elements of yeah. this where we, if we can just hold loosely without this tight expectation of, like, oh, it's going to have to be this way if I'm going to do it. And just yeah. like, Let's what's coming is coming. We're, yeah. we're one yeah. of us, right? We're not going to stop it. So let's just pivot. Let's just adapt. Let's go figure out how we can become the kind of people who we would want to be around. What would it look like if you really were in love with yourself? Not this neurotic self aggrandizing, like I'm the best, but in a, wow, um, I could, who could I become if I leaned into hard things? Because hard things come yeah, whatever scenario time history we're talking about. So right. become fascinated with who you can become and it and the world becomes a a kinder place because you're looking for you're looking at it through that lens then. This person's on their journey and they're on they're doing the best they can with the day they have too. And maybe I can just show them a little bit of grace today. Maybe I can help them out. Maybe I can make a difference. And the time to build community is before you need it. So very true. Yeah. We should all be working on that right now. Yeah. I <laughs> agreed. Agreed. Yep. Yes. Oh my God. Well, thank you so much, Christian. This has been an incredible conversation. Um, do you want to leave my listeners and audience with anything else, uh, before we close up here? Oh, sure. Yeah. I guess if you're interested in anything we're up to, you can a few different places you could find us. So truewholehuman.com is our website. That's where you can find out about our coaching. Um, uh, my blog that is, um, where I write about health and fitness and nutrition and all things COVID. Um, and I'll keep people updated on what we're up to is called deconstructing conventional. So it's a deconstructing conventional.com. Um, and then this, uh, starting the first quarter this year, we're going to be working on, uh, rolling out a program called the sovereignty project, which is just all about disentangling from the control grid and, um, building the flourishing life that we all want. So if anybody yeah. wants to stay abreast of that, you can just opt into our mailing list, um, on my blog, just any blog post or scroll down to the footer and you can opt in and, and stay aware of what we're doing there. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Well, thank you. Been a fun uh, experience being on your show. Yeah. Great. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs>